Today we're going to go over a little more with respect to the way uh, viruses and hosts interact. In particular, I want to talk about um, virulence. What is virulence? How do we measure it and what it does and what causes it and the kinds of things that can regulate it. So that's, that's what we're all about today. Virus-host interactions. Now virulence is the capacity of a virus to cause disease in a host. And we talk about a virulent virus that causes disease. We talk about an avirulent virus or an attenuated virus. We talk about attenuated vaccine strains. Their virulence is greatly reduced. Now we can measure virulence and you have to if you want to study it, of course. And there's a lot of ways that you can, and they're very different. And that should give you some clue that you cannot compare virulence very readily if there's so many ways to measure it, like mean time to death, uh, the time it takes for a symptom to appear, measurement of fever, weight loss, pathological lesions. You have to open up the animal that's been infected to measure them. We do that for polio, for HIV infection, the, the, the number of CD4 T cells in the blood is a measure of virulence, for example. So here are two uh, virulence assays, just to give you an idea. On the left is a um, survival curve. And on the left is cut off here, but it's uh, survival, number of surviving animals, I believe. And these are mice infected with two strains of poliovirus. And you can see the mice inoculated with type one survive, and the ones inoculated with type two don't. Uh, by day 10, they're all dead. So this is an example of a readout of virulence, survival. It's rather crude, but it's one way it can be measured. On the right is a different kind of readout. These are lesions in the central nervous system of uh, animals, mice again infected with a, a number of different viruses, including yellow fever and West Nile virus, um, the cerebrum, brain stem and spinal cord, you take sections of these and you look at them under a microscope and you look for lesions caused by the virus. So as a trained uh, pathologist, you can tell what the virus does. It causes cell, cell death and vacuolization and all kinds of other things. And you can put a number on those and that's what we've done here. We've used those numbers to calculate what's called a neurovirulence score. That is the, the amount of lesions in different parts of the brain. So you can see these viruses have uh, different levels of neurovirulence. So virulence is relative. You cannot say that polio is more virulent than smallpox or vice versa because the way you measure virulence in the two is completely different. And attempts to say which is the most virulent virus are very difficult at best. And so it's very difficult when someone says uh, Ebola is the most virulent virus or H5N1 is the most virulent virus because you can't really compare them. The virulence is influenced by all these parameters, how much virus you put in, of course, where you put it in in the animal, the route of inoculation, the kind of animal you use, uh, the age, gender, etc. Now in people, if you're just looking at natural infections, you could try to compare, but then you know, viruses are acquired in different ways. So rabies is acquired by a bite, whereas uh, influenza is acquired by inhalation. So it's really hard to compare the virulence by those two different routes. If you wanted to do that, you would have to have the same uh, inoculum by the same root, the same animal, and so forth. And for most viruses, you can't do that because everything is different. So here's an example of virulence depending on how you inoculate uh, virus into the animal. So this is um, two bunya viruses, lacrosse virus and tanya virus. And in mice, in suckling mice, uh, when you inoculate them uh, subcutaneously right under the skin with virus, uh, you can see that lacrosse virus makes a very nice viremia. And you know what that is by now. And it also replicates in the brain. You can take the mice and remove the brain at different times and look for virus by plaque forming units per mil. Uh, that virus grows quite well. That virus is quite neurovirulent when inoculated subcutaneously. But Tanya virus, on the other hand, does not cause of viremia, does not get into the brain, and is not virulent. Um, so the route of inoculation is important because if you take these two viruses and put them right into the brain, they're both replicating and they're both virulent. So depending on whether you put them peripherally or right in the brain. On the bottom is another uh, example of that, the effect of route of inoculation. 
Here we have two bunyaviruses, or one bunyavirus, but two variants of it. La Crosse, from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Anybody from La Crosse, Wisconsin? Uh, too bad. Um, <laughs> you could be happy that a virus was named after your town. Uh, these are two different strains, a wild type and an attenuated strain. And you can see we have, uh, the assay is the number of virions needed to kill half of the animals, all right? So we're putting them in either suckling mice, one day old mice, or adult mice. And we're infecting intracerebrally or subcutaneously. You can see the wild type, one PFU is enough to kill half the animals by IC or, or sub Q in suckling mice. In adult mice, one is enough IC, but you need more subcutaneously. So that's a little host age effect. Uh, the attenuated virus, one is enough if you put it directly in the brain, but if you put it subcutaneously, it takes over 100,000 PFU to kill half the mice, over a million IC and over uh, 10 million subcutaneously in adult mice. So you can see lots of effects here, root of inoculation, uh, the virus itself, one is wild type, one is attenuated, and the age of the host. Now in virology, we want to know all about virulence. We want to know what genes regulate it. We want to know the viral genes and the cellular genes, because obviously they're both. Those host effects means that there are cellular genes involved as well. Why do we want to do that? Because if you can understand what makes a virus virulent, maybe you could figure out how to stop it. Or maybe we don't know why we're studying it, and we'll find out one day. We'll learn something uh, serendipitous. That's how science works. And the way we identify the genes is by mutation. We make mutations in virus, and we look for mutations in genes that make the virus not virulent, and then we try and figure out what they're doing. Making a mutation in the host is also possible. It wasn't possible up until too long ago, but now we can knock out genes in mice. We can do other things to uh, alter specific gene expression, so we can ask uh, what host genes also are involved. Now, mice are one of the few animals that you can do that in. In people, you can't obviously knock out genes, but you can look at populations and see if mutations in certain genes go along with a certain virulence property of viruses, and we'll talk about that later. So here's an example of identifying virulence genes, genes that influence the capacity of a virus to cause disease in mice. So here we have a virus um, which we are inoculating intracerebrally into mice. So the wild type virus makes nice plaques in cell culture. You put it in the mouse brain, it replicates, causes disease. It's a neurovirulent virus. And we want to know what genes are causing this virus to be neurovirulent. So you make mutations in this virus and then you put each mutant virus in mice and you see what happens. Here's an example of a mutation that leads to a general defect in replication. The virus doesn't grow well in cell culture. You've, you've altered something essential for replication, so it doesn't grow well in cells. And as expected, you put it in mice, it doesn't replicate well there, and it doesn't cause much disease. We call it attenuated. This gene is not terribly interesting because it's, it's uh, active both in cell culture and in mice. We want genes that are specific for the animal, and those are harder to find, and this is an example of that. Here's a gene alteration in our virus that doesn't affect replication in culture. Or maybe it makes smaller plaques, but it grows pretty well. It doesn't grow well in mice, though, and it's attenuated. So that's a gene that is needed specifically for virulence in the animal. To me, that's the most interesting because it tells you about specific interactions within the host and not simply within cell cultures. So when you do this for many different viruses, and this has been done over the years, when you make mutations and test them in animal models, you, you get groupings of virulence genes in four different categories as shown here. And the first category are the ones I'm not too interested in. They just affect replication. You could study those and understand how the virus replicates in cells, but you're not going to learn anything specific about disease. Then there are genes and, and then it gets more interesting. There are genes that modify host defense mechanisms. As I told you a long time ago, every virus needs to antagonize host immunity in some way. Otherwise, it's wiped out by our immune systems. So viruses have these interesting genes. And you will hear from Dr. Silverstein uh, about some of them. We've already talked about one uh, that modifies the phosphorylation of EIF2 by PKR. Then there are genes that allow the virus to spread in the host. Uh, some viruses, as you remember, enter at mucosal surfaces. They replicate in the epithelium. And some viruses stay there, and they cause their disease there. But others 
spread somewhere else, like the CNS or the kidney, and they cause disease in those places. And we'd, we'd like to know what genes allow that kind of spread. And finally, there are genes with intrinsic cell-killing effects, which are responsible for disease in an animal but have little effect when you take them out of the virus and, and allow it to replicate in cell culture. You can also have non-coding sequences affect virulence. So far, I've been telling you about viral proteins, which when altered or removed from the virus can alter virulence. But you can have non-coding sequences as well. For example, uh, the Sabin vaccine strains, which are vaccine strains that are used to immunize against polio. We don't use them in this country any longer, but in the rest of the world where the eradication effort is underway, we use these Sabin strains. These are infectious viruses that you drink and they replicate in your gut, but they don't cause polio most of the time. Uh, and uh, they have mutations in their five prime non-coding regions. There's no alteration in the protein that's important for this. And uh, mango viruses, which are related Pocorna viruses that replicate in mice, they have a poly C tract in their five prime non-coding region. And as you shorten this tract, you make the viruses less virulent. Now, we don't know how these work, but the point here is that you don't have to alter a protein to alter the virulence of a virus. Here's an example of the poliovirus mutations in the Sabin strains. You may remember from a few lectures ago the internal ribosomal entry site of the iris of Picorna viruses. Uh, this, of course, controls translation by internal ribosome entry. And the, uh, there are three strains of Sabin polio vaccines, type 1, 2, and 3. We use all three of them. And they all have mutations in one of these stem loops. In particular, this one right here, stem loop 5. And that's expanded on the right. And you can see the red show you the mutations in the type 1, type 2, and the type 3 vaccine strains. Now, when Albert Sabin developed these vaccines, he was working in the 50s, and he didn't know anything about sequencing. We, we couldn't sequence nucleic acid. So he had no idea what he was selecting for during his empirical selection of these viruses. We'll talk about how these were derived uh, later on. But it's amazing that all three of his vaccine strains, which he selected separately, have s mutations in a very similar part of the genome, this one stem loop. Anyway, so these mutations are essential for reducing the virulence of poliovirus. In other words, the reason why you don't get polio when you take these vaccine strains is because of these mutations. And how they work, we really don't know. It's really uh, an, an open question. Now, the effect of these mutations are quite dramatic. I want to show you what they do. This is a growth curve of poliovirus uh, in the mouse brain. So this is a very straightforward experiment. You take mice, you inject virus directly into the brain, and then at various days after infection, you take a few mice and you take the brain out, you grind it up, and you do a plaque assay, which you remember how to do, and you calculate PFU per uh, gram. So here on the y-axis, PFU per gram and here is time. And you see we have two viruses here, two polioviruses. And the only thing that's different between them is one base in the 5' prime non-coding region. And that is at 472. And I'll go back one slide to show you. That was right here. This is the base in the type 3 strain, which is the one that changes to make that a vaccine strain. So the virus with a C multiplies, as you can see. It grows quite well in the brain. And it paralyzes mice. Here is the LD50, actually kills them. The LD50 is the lethal dose, 50%. That's the amount of virus it takes to kill half the animals. So about 9,000 PFU, and that virus has the C. So that's the parent strain from which Sabin made his vaccines. Now, if you change that base to a U, you see the virus does not replicate. It's cleared from the CNS, and this virus does not cause paralysis. You can put a million or 10 million PFU in these animals right in the brain and they will walk around fine and they're, they're happy as anything. All right, and so this one base change in a non-coding region of the genome is enough to do that. So that's quite remarkable. So the point, the point is, yes? Could you just go back to the slide that shows the mutations? This one? Yeah, so um, for the third strain, it's a U instead of a C. Um, uh -huh. And for the first strain, um, so is one is a, a change. Um, uh, so uh, what you're saying is this is wrong, yeah. 
uh, something is, is, mis, is mistyped here, because this obviously is the right bass. But it's always a bass swap. It's always the same in all the three strains. Yeah, it's a single bass change. It's a, U to, it's a C to U here, um, and I forget what the change. See, obviously, the, uh, these changes are not right here, so I don't know what's going on there. But it's a single bass change in each of the three strains. And what I've shown you here for the type 3 is how changing that one bass can affect virulence. Okay. All right, so back to proteins. Um, what kinds of proteins modify host defense mechanisms? Um, some of them are called virokines. These are secreted proteins. These are produced by the virus, so they mimic cytokines. Um, and that's why they're called virokines. They mimic cytokines, growth factors, or any extracellular immune mediators. We've talked about some cytokines already and how they modulate the immune response to infection. So viruses uh, mimic them, and they produce mimics that don't function. So they bind receptors and don't transduce the signal that a cytokine would, so they interfere with the in immune response. And at the in the same way, some viruses make homologs of the cytokine receptors. Soluble receptors are called viral receptors, and they bind to cytokines or chemokines, and they prevent them from acting. So you can see where these kinds of molecules, and you'll perhaps hear more from Dr. Silverstein about those, how they could interfere with host defenses. So when they're present, they make the virus virulent because it overcomes host defenses. When you take them away, the virus is cleared. Uh, so these are molecules that mimic s cellular molecules that are critical to host defense. You don't need these for cell culture. Cell culture, you don't have an adaptive response. Uh, so you don't, if you take out these genes, it makes no difference. And most of them are found in large DNA viruses. They have a genome that can accommodate these. Um, the smaller viruses have other ways of, of getting around the same problems. I think in particular, you will hear about proteins that infect, that affect antigen presentation by major histocompatibility molecules from Dr. Silverstein. But as you might guess, there are also complement antagonists encoded in these viral genomes. Now here's an example of a viral virulence gene of this sort. This is a gene in a gamma herpes virus 68, and this uh, gene called M3 encodes a chemokine receptor. So this is a soluble chemokine receptor that's going to be elaborated from the infected cell, and it will bind any chemokines that are being produced whose job it is to recruit immune cells into the area, and the immune cells won't come because they don't get the signal. So if you delete the... Um, gene encoding M3 from, from uh, this herpes virus, and you infect mice, this is what you get. So we're looking at percent survival again on the y-axis, and this is the dose of virus. So for wild-type virus in blue, you get a dose-response curve going from small amounts of virus to increasing. Uh, if you delete this M3 gene, that's the green, you now see that it takes more virus to kill all of the animals. So the, the dose-response curve has been attenuated. Uh, and then in these kinds of experiments, whenever you delete a gene, you'll, you always want to build a virus where you put it back to make sure that your manipulation has not caused any other changes. So you do, what you do is shown here with this red virus. You do a marker rescue because you put the gene back in, and you can see now you've restored the wild-type killing. So this phenotype in the green is not due to some other mutation that you inadvertently introduced during uh, your cloning process. So that's one output or one measure of the virulence. Here's another. This is infiltration of immune cells into infected tissue. So you take the mice infected with these three different viruses, same color scheme, uh, wild type in blue, and the deletion virus is in green. And then you, you take tissue sections and you count the number of macrophages, neutrophils, lymphocytes, or monoblasts that are infiltrated into the region. And I just want to point out that the wild-type virus has a certain level of macrophage infiltration. If you take away uh, the chemokine receptor, you have more macrophages coming in. And it makes sense because the chemokines help attract them. And if you, in the wild-type virus, you're making a chemokine receptor that is blocking uh, that effect. And you see in the other tissues, there's less an effect. There's an inverse effect on neutrophils, and uh, that's not really clear why. All right, so those are genes that affect immune functions. Then there are some toxic viral proteins. There aren't too many of these. Uh, you may know that bacteria have lots of toxins of various sorts that have very specific cell killing activities. In general, viruses tend not to have such toxin, but here is one. Uh, it's the NSP4 glycoprotein of rotaviruses. These are viruses that cause gastroenteritis. Uh, 
We will talk about those uh, later on. But these viruses replicate in your intestine and cause diarrhea and vomiting. They cause a fluid imbalance in the intestine. And one of the reasons we think uh, this fluid imbalance results is a consequence of this glycoprotein. So this glycoprotein is produced in infected cells. So this is a epithelial monolayer in your intestine. It's the villus border. Uh, and these cells are infected with rotaviruses. They're producing NSP4. And this protein has a number of effects. It loosens up the junctions between the cells. Uh, it increases intracellular calcium levels. And it causes uh, excretion of chloride from the cells. And all of this contributes to the fluid imbalance leading to diarrhea. And there's also some thought that this protein interacts with the enteric nervous system. Uh, the gut is highly innervated and that controls the movement of the gut. And it's thought that the interaction of this protein may help uh, stimulate the movement leading to, to diarrhea. Uh, here's an, an example of a cellular virulence factor. So far we're talking about virus genes that influence virulence but certainly there's the cellular counterpart as well. Uh, TRIM5-alpha is a very interesting cellular gene that regulates uh, infection by um, immunodeficiency viruses. Now, old world monkeys are not infected by HIV-1. Uh, if you infect the animals or cells derived from them uh, with virus, the virions get in the cell, but there's a block before reverse transcription. So think back to that reverse transcription slide where the virus is coming in and it begins to make DNA in the cytoplasm before getting into the nucleus. So before the reverse transcription occurs, there's a block to replication of these viruses. And this is due, this block is due to this protein called TRIM5-alpha. It seems to bind the viral capsid, so the capsid's in the cytoplasm, and degrades it so that reverse transcription doesn't occur. So this is a species-specific protein that evolved to uh, enable defense. We don't have this protein. We have a relative of it, but obviously it doesn't work uh, to prevent HIV infection in humans. Uh, then, to take it a step further, we talked about non-coding viral sequences. MicroRNAs can also regulate um, virus virulence. And I, I might have mentioned MIR-122 before. This is a liver-specific microRNA, small 21 nucleotide RNAs produced by our genomes that regulate gene expression. And this one is a normal liver-specific enzyme. It's involved in cholesterol metabolism. But it happens to be absolutely required for the replication of hepatitis C virus in the liver. In hepatocytes and culture, if you take away MIR-122, the virus will not replicate. It seems to be involved in stabilizing the viral uh, RNA. It binds to the 5 prime N and has some effects there. When you give animals, so you can give chimpanzees uh, hepatitis C by infecting them. You can, if you give these animals an antagonist of MIR-122, these are called antagomeres. They're short RNAs that bind to the mirror, they're the complementary sequence, and they're chemically modified so they're very stable. They will bind and make it double-stranded so it doesn't work anymore as a mirror. When you give these antagomeres to chimps, you protect them from disease. So this is a virulence factor. It's absolutely needed to produce disease. And in fact, these drugs, these antagomeres, which are short locked nucleic acids, they're called, they are now in clinical trial uh, to prevent hepatitis C. So there's an example of you identify a viral virulence factor and you can put it to practical use right away. Now, so that's a little broad consideration of, of virulence. Let's look now in tissues where, where the expression of virulence occurs. So the, the ultimate expression of viral virulence is tissue damage, whether it be in the gut or the lung or the CNS. Let's talk about what causes this damage. Now, we have talked a lot in this course about viruses replicating in cell culture and you infect them and often the cells die, they're released from the plate, they have cytopathic effects uh, and that's how the infection ends. And the viruses that do that of course, of course are called cytolithic or cytopathic viruses. They kill cells. And we are just really beginning to understand why viruses do that. I think our understanding is rudimentary. We know that viruses inhibit host cell macromolecular processes like nucleic acid synthesis and protein synthesis. 
that probably contributes to killing cells. Enzymes leak out of membranous components. Um, apoptosis is induced, which contributes to killing cells. We talked about how some envelope viruses lead to syncytium formation. So all of these contribute to tissue damage. But the reality is that in many virus infections, there's not a lot of vir direct virus-induced tissue damage. For example, when you're infected with rhinoviruses, which cause common colds, they cause about half of all the common colds, and you look in the respiratory tract of people who are infected with rhinoviruses, you see very little cell damage. The virus really doesn't kill the cell. So the pathology of the infection is due to something else. So besides virus effects on cells, what else is there? Well, there's your response to virus infection. And so I think that in most cases, most of the symptoms and a lot of the pathology of a virus infection is really caused by our response uh, to the virus. So let's explore that a little. We, we call this immunopathology. And it's too much of a good thing because, you know, you need an immune response to clear the infection, but you pay a price. Um, you pay a price in clinical symptoms, fever, tissue damage, aches, pains, nausea. These are largely due to your immune response to the disease. The virus itself is not damaging you so you feel pain. It's your immune response, your cytokines that give you the fever and the nausea and so forth. And the most clear examples of these are for viruses that don't damage cells. As I said, you look in an infected person and you can't see evi any evidence of uh, tissue damage. So in non-cytolytic virus infections, disease is largely a result of the immune response. So let's explore uh, a few examples of this because this is important to emphasize to you because I think most people come into virology thinking the virus is really doing all the damage, but it's you, unfortunately. So here are some examples of um, immunopathology, and they are divided up according to the immune compartment uh, that causes it. These are uh, adaptive immunopathologies, that is antibodies or cellular mediated pathologies. Uh, there are also some of the innate response, and we'll talk about that uh, later on. So there, as you know, T cells can be CD8 or CD4 positive. The CD8s, the cytolytic T cells, cytotoxic T cells, they can cause uh, pathologies in animals infected with, with these different viruses. In the same way, the CD4 T cells, the ones that produce cytokines, they're either Th1 or Th2 types, depending on what kinds of cytokines they produce, they can also cause immunopathologies. And you can see the viruses here uh, are, are have pathologies that are directly related to those subsets of cells. And we can figure this out in animal models by depleting them uh, for specific subsets. And finally, there are antibody-mediated immunopathologies. For example, de dengue virus is one, and we'll talk about that. So here's an experiment which shows uh, viral disease mediated by CD8-positive cytotoxic T lymphocytes. We talked briefly last time about how uh, virus-specific CTLs are amplified in an, in an infection. The dendritic cells go to the lymph node and instruct the T cells to differentiate into CTLs. And then these go out to the site of infection and start to lyse the infected cells. Well, as you can imagine, that's going to cause tissue damage. You're lysing cells. But you have to do that, I guess, to get rid of the infection. Now, in, in, this is a mouse model where you infect um, with a arena virus called lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus, LCMV. This is a virus that is a rodent virus, but will occasionally, if you keep rodents as pets and you get immunosuppressed for whatever reason, you can be infected by them. And it's known to kill people who are immunosuppressed, say, for transplants. They get the virus from their hamster, pet hamster. Anyway, uh, you infect LCMV intracerebrally into mice, and eight days later they're dead. They have lethal choreomeningitis. Now, if you do the same experiment, but after you inoculate virus, you immunosuppress the mice. You can give them chemical treatments to prevent the development of an immune response. Then the mice are fine. They develop a persistent infection, so the virus is circulating in them, it's replicating, but they don't die. So this suggests to us that the immune response is what's killing them. Of course, it's also what's clearing the virus, but apparently you can survive for a while with this virus in you. So how do you address that? Well, then you take these persistently infected mice and you give them virus-specific 
CD8 positive T cells, which you get from another animal that's been infected. You can purify the CD8s from them, and you can purify, in fact, the virus-specific ones these days with very sophisticated flow cytometry. And when you give those to a mouse, that's called adoptive immunization. When you give it to these persistently infected mice, five days later, they're dead. So the implication is that the CTLs are causing lethality. So that's one example. Uh, here are two others. Top again is LCMV. And on the left is an experiment where we infect mice with this virus. And then we're looking at percent survival uh, after infection. Now here we have gone a little more deeper into the T cell. Instead of just depleting the T cells and restoring them, we have knocked out the perforin gene in mice. The perforin is one of the two uh, types of toxins or pore formers that CTLs use to punch holes in target cells. So you have wild type mice and perforin null mice. The, the null is missing here, but it's minus minus. So they can't make perforin, so their T cells are, are defective at killing. And uh, we're looking at virus a percent living here, and look at this. The wild type mice are dead by day 10, which is what I told you in the previous slide, but the perforin knockout mice survive. So these mice still have T cells. We haven't immunosuppressed them, but they have a genetic defect which makes them not make perforin, which is an essential killing component of the CTLs. Now on the right is the measurement of the serum levels of a liver enzyme. One of the things this virus does is to cause hepatitis in these animals. And so when the, a measure of hepatitis, a very easy measure is to take blood and measure um, uh, de this uh, dehydrogenase enzyme, which is released from damaged liver cells. Uh, and you can see in wild type mice, the perforin plus plus mice, uh, a few days after infection, the levels, serum levels of this liver enzyme go up. So this means that there's liver damage being sustained. We don't know what's causing it. But if you do the same assay in a perforin null mice, there's no, uh, dehydrogenase in the blood. So this suggests that, again, the T cells, and in particular the perforin, are responsible for causing the liver damage in this model. On the bottom is infection with Coxsackie virus. Now Coxsackie is a coronavirus related to polio. And in people, one of the ways this infects us, it infects our heart. And many people who require heart transplants often require it because they have a a Coxsackie infection that they don't know about. It starts and it proceeds until their, their, their heart muscle is damaged. And by that time, it's too late to repair it in any way. There's no antiviral to get rid of it. And so they need a heart transplant. So a Coxsackie myocardial infection is, is very common precursor to transplants. Now, there, there's good evidence that the damage caused by, to the heart is actually CTL mediated. So this is a mouse model for infection. You infect mice with uh, virus. And, uh, you take a section of the heart when the mice have developed myocarditis, and there's a lot of pathology here. This is stained with a, a dye that stains um, calcified and fibrotic tissue uh, blue. And this is a typical uh, picture of, of myocardial damage caused by Coxsackie infection. So that's a wild-type mouse. These mice have myocarditis. On the right is a perforin knockout mouse infected with Coxsackie virus. There's no tissue damage at all. The cells are healthy. Now, there's some virus in these animals, and the consequence of that is not clear. But the implication is simply that, again, the T cells, and in particular the CD8 uh, positive T cells, are causing uh, the immunopathology. <clears throat> Same goes for hepatitis B virus. As you know from the name and from the little we've talked about it, this is a virus that targets the liver. It's one of those viruses that encodes reverse transcriptase. If you, and this virus, remember, is enveloped. It has an enveloped glycoprotein in the envelope. If you take the gene for that glycoprotein and you make transgenic mice expressing that gene, those mice are fine. They can live a long and happy life with this transgene in them expressing, and it doesn't matter. But if you now give them by adoptive transfer, hepatitis B-specific cytotoxic T lymphocytes, then they get liver lesions. And what's found is that the CTLs attach to hepatocytes that are expressing the viral glycoprotein, 
and they induce apoptosis. That's one of the ways CTLs kill target cells. Besides punching holes in them, they can bind to a receptor that induces apoptosis, as you will hear uh, from Dr. Silverstein. Now, this is just a diagram of how you do the experiment. You would take a non-transgenic mouse and immunize it with hepatitis B uh, glycoprotein, and this, uh, then you culture spleen cells and you purify um, T cells that are specific for the virus. You can check that in vitro, and then you would adoptively transfer that into your transgenic mice. And if you, that's when you see liver disease, when you put these uh, virus-specific CTLs. So again, the CTLs are causing the disease. All right, so that's CD8. Two examples of CD8-mediated immunopathology. As, now, as you know, CD4 cells uh, have a different role during adaptive responses. They elaborate cytokines. They elaborate cytokines that help B cells differentiate into antibody-producing cells, and they elaborate cytokines that help CTLs differentiate. So you can imagine that these would also play some roles in immunopathologies as well. So these cells make a lot of cytokines, and these cytokines, uh, as I said, cause differentiation. They can also recruit various other immune cells to infected areas, such as neutrophils and mononuclear cells. And so these, vi these cells have also been implicated in immunopathologies. Um, these cells cause release, uh, these cytokines cause release of protease, reactive radicals like nitric oxide, and cytokines like TNF-alpha, which can also cause uh, tissue damage. So let's consider um, one example of CD4-mediated immunopathology, uh, and this is a disease called herpes stromal keratitis. It's a herpes viral infection of the eye, but it can lead to blindness, as you can see by this opaque uh, cornea here. One of the most common causes of blindness in developed countries, and this is almost entirely immunopathological and based on uh, the infiltration of CD4 positive Th1 cells, not Th2, but Th1 cells. And uh, each time you get infected in the eye, you get more and more opacity until you don't see any longer. So how does this work? Uh, here are two sections of uh, the, the eye where the virus is replicating. So here is the cornea, the corneal epithelium up here and underneath it are the stromal cells. And the virus replicates up here in the epithelial cells. But it's actually the stroma, the underlying stroma, uh, that is damaged. Uh, and this is a section showing uh, some infiltration of presumably CD4 positive T cells into the stroma. Uh, and so these are CD4 cells recruited to the infected area. They produce cytokines and other mediators, uh, and they damage the stromal cells. Of course, their intent is to help clear the infection from the epithelium, but the stroma uh, suffers the damage. And that's why eventually uh, you get blindness, because these, these cytokines damage the tissue, this tissue structure. The poxes and rashes caused by many viruses are also immune-mediated effects. Um, measles, smallpox, varicella zoster, they are all producing rashes as a child with measles. Uh, rash, typical measles rash. And these happen when virus, now remember in measles, the virus enters your respiratory tract, eventually gets into your blood, disseminates, replicates in other tissues, and then makes it to your skin. Uh, but the virus alone doesn't cause the rash. It's the interaction of the virus uh, with immune cells. Th1 cells and macrophages um, produce cytokines, and these increase the capillary permeability. They, they bring T cells into the infected area of the skin, and eventually you get a rash as a consequence. So it's an immunopathological rash. Now here's an example of an innate immune immunopathology. So far we've been talking about adaptive ones. And this is involving toll-like receptor 3, which you may remember senses uh, double-stranded RNA leading to interferon production. And this is a mouse model of West Nile virus infection. Now you remember, remember West Nile uh, causes a lot of inapparent infections, but about 1% of infections the virus gets in your brain causes encephalitis. And this is a serious infection because a lot of these individuals may recover, but they have uh, neurological sequelae. So the question is why? What's going on in the brain? Now, in mice, if you knock out the TLR3 gene, these mice are more resistant 
to infection. They make less cytokines. Remember, TLR3 senses double-stranded RNA, and then it increases the production of cytokines, including interferons. And one of those cytokines is tumor necrosis factor alpha. And one of the known effects of TNF alpha is that it makes the brain blood barrier more permeable. A few lectures ago, we talked about how the brain has a very tight barrier in, in the circulation to prevent things from easily getting in. Well, TNF compromises that. Um, so uh, my view of this is that the viruses are not supposed to be getting to the brain, but when they do, because of the barrier, but when they do, then you have an innate response and that really leads to trouble. So here's an example where uh, we can show that experimentally. These are brains of mice. They're taken out of the mice after infection at different times. So these are wild type mice. So they're infected with West Nile virus. And then they're given a dye, a blue dye, which normally doesn't get into the brain. Uh, so let's see, um, sorry, it doesn't normally get into the brain, um, but if you infect these animals with West Nile virus, you see by day three, uh, the brains are turning blue. So this is a very nice visual assay for um, making, compromising the blood-brain barrier. Now, if you do the same experiment in TLR3 knockouts, you see uh, a delay in the brain turning blue, and it's much less blue, okay? Uh, so basically what's happened here is that infection is triggering TLR3, uh, and that causes elaboration of TNF-alpha, which permeabilizes the brain, and then your dye can, can get in. Uh, on the right are a few more experiments to show that. This is a shorter time course in wild-type mice. You can see within 24 hours, uh, the brains are permeable to the dye, and this can be duplicated with poly-IC. Poly-IC is synthetic double-stranded RNA, so you can inject this into mice. Uh, and if these are wild-type mice, the brain absorbs the dye. If they're toll-like receptor 3 knockout mice, the dye doesn't get in. So you see that TLR3 triggers the production of cytokines, which are not good for the brain. Virus isn't meant to go there. That's, that's really the message that comes from this. And when it does, it causes immunopathology. Now, maybe this can be used in some way to uh, reduce the brain damage in encephalitis. Maybe we can try antagonizing TNF, as long as that doesn't cause a worse uh, virus infection. All right, so back to the adaptive response. Uh, this is now an a immunopathology caused by antibodies. And this is dengue fever. This is a, a Flavy virus uh, shown here. It is um, an icosahedral capsid, which is enveloped, and it's transmitted by the mosquito Aedes aegypti. And this virus is endemic in, in many parts of the world where the mosquito is present, as you can see here. There are essentially billions of people who are at risk, meaning they could be infected because the virus and the vector are both present. At the, at the moment, there are about 50 million infections a year globally, which doesn't sound like a lot, but um, it, it, it will be in a moment as you hear what can happen here. So this is, this is second uh, only to malaria among the insect-borne diseases. Now the vector has, the disease has spread as the vector has been transported uh, all over the world. At the top is a map showing in uh, red areas with both the mosquito and dengue virus. So you can see largely uh, southern hemisphere. And uh, at one time here prior to 1981, South America had no dengue. Uh, and um, by 1981 to 2003, it had invaded the country. And the reason it went there is because of the used tire trade. So when your tires on your car wear out, you know, you, your, gar your garage will take them for a buck and they sell them to someone else who eventually puts them on a big container boat uh, and they're sitting on the deck and they fill water because you can never get the water out. And there are thousands and thousands of tires on these ships, so they're not going to have people dumping them out one by one. Anyway, they'll get full of water again. And those water, the water in there breeds mosquitoes. And this is the way mosquitoes spread around the world, by shipping these bloody tires around the world. So that's why the disease is in South America and spreading elsewhere uh, at the moment. And that's the way Aedes albopictus has spread around the world, too, in those used tires. I don't know what the solution to that is. Anyway, dengue fever, the first time you get it, uh, it's, a, it's a standard virus syndrome, if you will. It's a febrile illness. You can get headache, back, and limb pain, some rash. 
Um, and in particular, there's a, a unique pain in the bones, which is very specific for dengue. But this is not a life-threatening illness, typically. You're, you're well in seven to 10 days. In one in 14,000 infections, though, you can get a hemorrhagic fever, which means you have a high fever with capillary bleeding, and this can be life-threatening. And sometimes you can bleed as a consequence, and that leads to loss of life with this hemorrhagic syndrome. So when you're infected, as usual, you make antibodies to this virus. There are four serotypes. They so say you get infected with serotype one, you make antibodies to it, and you recover. The problem is if you get infected again. Uh, so now you get infected, say, with serotype two. So here's a, a, an illustration showing that. Here is a dengue virus. And uh, you're infected with serotype two. Now you make a, a really strong memory response to serotype one, because that's what you were infected with before. Th those antibodies to serotype one will bind the dengue two that has infected you, but it won't block its infectivity. Remember last time we talked about the ways that antibodies can block virus infection. They can block attachment or uncoating, or they can make the viruses clump. None of those work for dengue when you're binding the virus with the wrong serotype antibody. What happens, though, is even worse. It wouldn't be bad if it stopped there. These virus particles bound to antibodies now can get into cells that they normally don't infect. This is the hypothesis anyway. It still remains to be proven. You know antibodies have the antigen binding Y part, and then at the bottom is an FC portion. And the FC portion can bind to receptors on various cell types. They're called FC receptors. Uh, they're shown right here that blue receptor. And this is a macrophage that's expressing an FC. So normally dengue wouldn't be infecting this macrophage. But now dengue gets into the macrophage because the FC receptors are endocytosed. It infects the macrophage. And then that's when the trouble begins. The macrophage can break open and release cytokines. Uh, it can be attacked by uh, CD8 cells and lysed. And, and all this is bad because the macrophage is full of uh, cytokines of various sorts. And as you know already, TNF alpha can cause problems, it can cause permeability and plasma leakage, and this is in part why you get this hemorrhagic syndrome. You get plasma leakage, you get complement activated, which causes uh, attack on the blood vessels as well. So basically you have an amplification of an immune response in an aberrant fashion. And now after the secondary infections, this hemorrhagic fever and shock syndrome, remember, which was one out of 14,000 cases, now it's one out of 90 for the fever and shock, one out of 50. So this is the real problem. All these people getting infected, 50 million a year, and then when they get infected again, um, they can die. So I had a friend who went to Puerto Rico last winter, and he came back to New York, and within a few days, his joints were killing him. His bones were aching. So he called me. I said, you go to a doctor. And he went, and the, guy, and the doc said, you have dengue fever. And there's nothing he could do about it. There's no antiviral. He just went home, and he got better. And then he said, should I go back to Puerto Rico? I said, I wouldn't, because all the serotypes are there. You're going to take a chance. So you know, any place where dengue is resident, once you get it once, you can't go back there. So the moral of the story is, just stay in New York. Right? <laughs> OK, a couple of other immune complex uh, diseases. This one is uh, also mediated by antibodies. So you see the dengue is an immune complex disease caused by the antibodies binding the virus and allowing it to get into the wrong cell. Here we're going to use antibodies again, but they're going to cause immune complexes that get deposited. Um, when you have a good immune response to a virus, you're making antibodies. They combine with the virus, and they can make rather large clumps, as we discussed last time. You can have viruses cross-linked by antibodies and make very large aggregates. Uh, these tend to get stuck in very, very small capillaries. And there are two places where this is a problem. In your kidney, you have very, very small diameter capillaries, and in your brain. And if you're having a vigorous immune response um, or a lot of viral replication in the presence of an inadequate neutralizing response, you can get these big complexes, and they clog the capillaries. And here is an example of what happens in the kidney. Uh, this is a, a blow up of the filtration apparatus of the kidney, the capillary here in the center. And these are immune complexes being deposited around it. They block the flow of fluids, and they cause inflammation. And you see here this mesangial cell is expanding, and it's basically causing a condition called glomerulonephritis, which impairs kidney function. So this can be caused by immune complexes depositing there. 
And this is something that complement should get around. Remember I told you complement helps dissolve these complexes, but in some cases it simply doesn't for reasons uh, we just don't know. And if this happens in your brain, then you feel confused. So maybe when you have flu and you feel confused, in part you're having uh, some, some capillary occlusion uh, in your brain. And this we talked about last time, so we don't really need to go in it again, but I just want to put it in here to emphasize that this is another form of immunopathology. We talked about nitric oxide synthase as an interferon-inducible gene, one of the ISGs, and its purpose is to help produce uh, nitrates and peroxynitrites from uh, arginine, and these at low concentrations are protective. They kill infected cells, um, and also non-infected cells, but they help to limit an infection. But when you have high concentrations of nitric oxide, you have tissue damage, and this has been clearly shown in animal models. You take away the nitric oxide synthase and you have less pathology. Okay, now uh, on to a slightly different topic, but again involving the interaction of viruses with the immune system, and this is immunosuppression. <clears throat> we have mentioned immunosuppression a couple of times. I, I said in the first lecture that when you're immunosuppressed, uh, whether it be by chemicals, if you have an organ transplant or an infection that causes immunosuppression, you're at risk for infection with viruses that you should normally clear. So I wanted to talk a little bit about immunosuppression by viruses here. We'll come back to this when we talk about HIV and AIDS because that, of course, is a disease where immunosuppression is a major part. So some viruses do suppress your immune responses globally at many levels, and there are multiple mechanisms depending on the virus. And for HIV, it's amazing. It just it just trashes almost every part of your immune system. Uh, the viruses can replicate in one or more cells, macrophages, T cells, CD4 cells. It can mess up cytokine production. It can mess up signaling that you need to produce cytokines. And as I said before, uh, in the process of evading the immune response viruses that produce viroceptors and virokines, they will cause immunosuppression because the chemokines and cytokines need to be acting in order to clear the virus infection. So here is an example of immunosuppression uh, in someone infected with measles. So in, when I was a kid, everybody got measles because there was no vaccine. You get a rash all over your body, uh, and then you got better. And now you have a measles vaccine, so none of you get measles anymore. But um, this is an example of how measles can immunosuppress a T cell response against an antigen. Now, there is a test called the tuberculin tine test. If you would like to know if you've ever been infected with tuberculosis, uh, you have a little bit of antigen, TB antigen, injected just under your skin. And if you've been infected, then you have a very vigorous T cell response and you get a swelling and redness very quickly. Uh, and then that's a positive T cell test. So what they did here is they took kids with measles and they gave them a tuberculin test at different times after uh, rash. So here is the kid without measles or kids without measles. This is in duration, the size of the bump caused by injection of tuberculin in millimeters. And here's a child with active rash. You do a tuberculin test, you get no reactivity. And then as the uh, rash goes away, you see the tuberculin test returns. So measles specifically immunosuppresses delayed type hypersensitivity, which is involving uh, T cells infiltrating to the injected area. So measles causes uh, severe immunosuppression. It infects monocytes and uh, thymic epithelial cells. It causes reduced delayed type hypertension, which is the assay I just told you. And you get other infections as a result. Uh, if you're not properly cared for, you get other infections that can kill you. Uh, rubella virus infects lymphoid cells, which uh, can make you also susceptible, but leads to persistent rubella infection. And as we will see, uh, HIV infects CD4 positive T cells and monocytes and makes you susceptible to all sorts of uh, opportunistic infections as well as cancers because cancers are surveyed by uh, the immune response. Uh, measles virus in particular has been extensively studied because its immunosuppression is quite severe. The virus infects dendritic cells and you can imagine the consequence of that given what we've talked about their function in immune responses. It infects monocytes. Monocytes are antigen-presenting cells. They present antigens uh, to T cells to see if they're foreign, and measles impairs that presentation. The number of lymphocytes in your body in, in someone with, with measles go down 50%, and your cytokine uh, 
productions are, are skewed. In particular, it skews from Th1 to Th2. And this is really bad for general uh, reaction to pathogens. OK. <clears throat> um, now, th the last 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about genes that control susceptibility, host genes that control susceptibility. And this is an example to get us started. This is a gene in mice. It's called FLV. And uh, it was years ago found to control susceptibility to a flavivirus. And just by crossing mice strains, so they, they had a mouse strain that was resistant to flavies. They started crossing mice and eventually got it down to one gene. It turned out to be the gene encoding this protein, 2 prime, 5 prime oligo A synthetase. You may, may remember this is an ISG, an interferon stimulated gene, whose role is to uh, degrade, to produce an oligo that activates RNA cell and degrades viral RNA. So mice that lack this gene are more susceptible to flaviviruses, this particular gene. As far as we know, this doesn't play any role in human susceptibility, but I, I give it to you as an example of how we study these. Uh, here's an experiment that shows the effect of this gene on susceptibility in mice. Uh, this is looking at virus per gram. So remember, when you measure virulence or susceptibility, you have to have a readout, as I said earlier. And the readout here is just virus production. <coughs> um, so here are our susceptible mice. Uh, these mice have uh, a mutation in, in FLV, and they all die. Uh, and these are resistant mice. Uh, they make less virus, and half of them die. These mice have an intact FLV. So one gene difference uh, makes a difference in, in virus multiplication uh, and survival. So as I said, we don't know of FLV's role in any, in any human disease, but we do now have suggestions about others, and I want to go through a few of them. They're very interesting. With the ability to sequence the human genome and look at polymorphisms in people with different infections, we can now start to correlate mutations with susceptibility. It's a correlation, obviously. Uh, and sometimes you can do experiments. You can take, say, if you identify people that have a gene mutation that you think influences susceptibility to infection, you can take fibroblasts from them. It's very easy to take them from either the blood or the inside of the cheek, put them in culture, and then test to see if, in fact, uh, virus replicates or does not in them, and if restoring the gene complements the problem. Uh, so uh, most of the genes we've found by doing this encode components of our immune systems. Uh, one, for example, is a mutation in CCR5. This is one of the receptors for HIV. HIV requires this to get into cells. Uh, a mutation in this protein, or an absence of the protein, blocks infection with HIV viruses that utilize it. This is present, this gene, this allele, is present in 5 to 14 percent of northern Europeans. These people, and if you are homozygous for the deletion, which some people are, you don't get infected with HIV. And you may know of the German AIDS patient who received stem cell therapy a number of years ago. So his bone marrow was ablated and replaced with uh, stem cells with bone marrow from a donor who had this Delta 32 mutation. And this patient is now cured of, of AIDS. The virus had no more cells in which to replicate because his bone marrow now repopulated his immune system with lymphocytes that lack CCR5. Okay, so it made that individual cure. Now, this is not a cure for HIV because you can't give people uh, bone marrow transplants to do that. It's simply too high fatality rate, too expensive. But the principle is that if you can identify such mutations, you might find therapy to be useful. There is an antiviral that targets CCR5. Uh, and we, it is used, but it has to be used in combination therapy because you do get resistance uh, quite rapidly. Another interesting set of genes that controls susceptibility is for herpes simplex uh, infection. Now, herpes simplex is a virus you get early in life. You acquire it at a primary infection at a mucosal surface. Uh, it causes initial infection, and then it becomes latent. And you'll hear more about this from Dr. Silverstein. And periodically, it's reactivated. It replicates, and it can cause lesions, oral lesions again, for example. But sometimes it gets into the brain, and it, there it can cause a lethal encephalitis. So herpes encephalitis is rather rare. Uh, there are two to four cases per million people globally per year. And if you don't treat it, you can treat it with antivirals. If you don't treat it, it's 70% mortality. There are two peaks of incidence of herpes encephalitis. One at very young age, six months to three years. And this uh, corresponds to the time when you first get uh, 
your, the virus, the first time you see herpes simplex, sometimes the virus can get into your brain. And then as you're older and you have reactivations of the virus from latency, you also see a peak of incidence of simplex encephalitis. So it turns out by studying these individuals who get herpes simplex encephalitis and studying their families, in fact, you can pinpoint the mutations that lead to this. And they are in very interesting genes. Look, TLR3, and you may recognize TRIF and TRAF. These are proteins in the signaling pathway from TLR3 to uh, production of cytokines in the nucleus. So mutations in TLR3, the sensor for double-stranded RNA, and UNC93B, which is a protein that helps transport the toll-like receptors to the endosome through the ER, as well as two proteins involved in signaling. If you have a mutation in one of these, you're predisposed to getting herpes simplex encephalitis. And what they've been able to do is take cells from these patients and put them in culture and show that they make a lot more virus than normal cells. And if you put the TRIF or the TLR3 genes back in, you complement the GFAC. So this is a really interesting example of where you can explain serious disease after infection by a polymorphism uh, in an immune gene. Another interesting one is the IFIT-M gene family. These are ISGs, interferon-stimulated genes, uh, and the, one of them is called IFIT-M3. These are membrane proteins. Their function is not really understood, but people who get severe pneumonia after influenza virus, uh, a proportion of them are enriched for a mutation in this particular gene. Uh, this cartoon at the bottom just shows what some of the IFIT-M proteins are thought to do. Some of them may block uh, attachment, some of them may block endocytosis or fusion or even release of virus. So M3, we don't know the exact way this blocks flu, but apparently people who have mutations in the gene encoding this are more likely to get severe uh, influenza. And the last thing I want to tell you is that the MHC proteins are a major determinant of disease susceptibility. In fact, all right, so let me explain why. The MHC proteins, of course, display viral antigens on the surface of antigen-presenting cells to lymphocytes in order to be recognized and amplify an immune response. The ability of the MHC to recognize a peptide depends on your arsenal of MHC peptides that you are born with. And if you have a diverse arsenal, you're more likely to be able to prevent, present a diverse range of peptides. So island populations that tend to be less diverse have lower diversity in MHC and are more susceptible to infection. Individuals who control HIV infection very well, we'll talk about those, these are called elite controllers. They have a very specific MHC type that lets them present the variety of HIV peptides that evolve during uh, an infection. And this is just a, an example of, of this in mice. This, we're looking at uh, infection of the spleen in a, a mouse model for a viral disease. And these are two different H MHC haplotypes, AA or AB. And you can see the difference in disease just by the MHC. And this, again, is based on the ability of these MHCs to present uh, viral antigens. Uh, sometimes co-infections can enhance virulence. This is a recently discovered one between HIV and HSV2. Uh, herpes simplex 2 is the herpes virus that causes genital infections. And it's been known for a long time that people with sexually transmitted dis diseases other than HIV are more susceptible to HIV uh, infection. It was always thought that was because there are open lesions in the genitals which allow virus to enter. Well, it turns out that there's a molecular basis for this. Uh, it turns out that the presence of H HSV2 enhances the ability of HIV to infect Langerhan cells. These are dendritic cells in the mucosa which are believed to be among the primary sites of HIV infection. And the reason why HSV2 does this is when HSV2 uh, infects the epithelial cells, they produce an antimicrobial peptide. This is part of our intrinsic defenses. And a particular antimicrobial peptide called LL37, doesn't matter what the name is, enhances HIV infection of the Langerhans cells because this peptide gets into Langerhans cells and it turns up the amount of CD4 and CCR5, CXCR4, the receptors for the virus on the surface of the cells. So amazingly, HSV2 stimulates susceptibility by increasing uh, the receptors for the virus.
Okay, a couple of things in closing. Age is a determinant of susceptibility. Very young and very old people are the most susceptible. Uh, we think the young people are, are, are um, they have an actual immature Im immune response, so they can't clear infections very well. But if you look at young people who are infected, these are mainly infants and very young children, they have less immunopathology than others. So that may be a clue that if you have a, a lowered immune response, you have less pathology. Unfortunately, in this case, they have more virus in them. Uh, this is mimicked in an animal model, LCMV, which we talked about. Uh, adult mice, the infection is lethal, but, but in, infant mice survive. And why are older people more susceptible? We think uh, their alveoli are less elastic. They have re weaker respiratory muscles, diminished cough reflex. I mean, these explain respiratory infections, but we really don't understand for other sorts uh, of infections. Uh, here's an example of age-specific mortality. This is a chart showing um, the incidence per 100,000 of West Nile virus infection uh, and the percent mortality with age. This is decade of life. So you can see the older individuals are not only more susceptible, but they die at a higher frequency. So the older are more susceptible to death. Middle-aged individuals get infected, but they typically do not die. There are a couple of interesting exceptions to the age phenomena. There are some virus infections that are actually mild at a young age. Polio, for example, if you get it very young, you tend not to get paralyzed. You only get paralyzed when you're in your teens and older. And maybe that's because there is a good balance of an immune response. So we have less immunopathology, but we can still control infection. The um, 1918 flu pandemic uh, was lethal for the very young and the very old, as you would expect for a respiratory infection. But there was this bump of lethality for young adults between 18 and 30 years old. And this is shown as a classic. So the classic um, W curve here for respiratory infection. So this is influenza uh, mortality in the U.S. from 1911 to 1915. You can see excess mortality in the very young and the very old. So this is very typical in every year of influenza. But in 1918, during this unusual pandemic, uh, there was a spike also in this middle age group. And this actually wiped out entire villages in Alaska of all the middle-aged adults left a lot of kids uh, without any parents to take care of them. We don't understand uh, why this is so. It's a peculiar oddity. Other determinants include gender, uh, males slightly more susceptible to viral infections, but pregnant women in particular can get very severe hepatitis, influenza, uh, and polio. We don't really understand that. It may be related to hormonal levels. Malnutrition increases susceptibility. Uh, again, not really well understood, but a great example is measles. Uh, in developing country where there is poor nutrition, measles is 300 times more uh, lethal than it is in the U.S. Cigarette smoking increases susceptibility to respiratory infections. So these, there are very clear studies showing that probably breaks down immune barriers. Air pollution, so maybe you shouldn't stay in New York after all. <laughs> And stress, like that imposed by our exams, I guess. So when you're stressed, just have some desserts. 